Thank you everyone for uh, coming to have us discuss this uh, topic where we are interested in how the genomic diversity of African populations will impact on health and in particular in how people respond to medicines, the field we call pharmacogenomics. So today I will try to cover some aspects of our work and that of others that is speaking to a future where uh, treatment is not going to be one treatment fits all, but one where one's treatment is designed and tailored based on their genetic makeup and indeed on their disease state and other drugs they might be taking uh, at the same time. So the title is Pharmacogenomics in Personalized Medicine from Research Bench to Patient Bedside in Africa. So as we are actually celebrating Africa Day, for, for me also this year is particularly interesting because it is 30 years since I did my first publication in this area of uh, pharmacogenetics. So the first paper I published was uh, when I was a, a, a young student with a lot of hair on my head. As you can see, things have changed a lot along the way. And that paper was in 1993 where we looked at the genetic variation of a particular enzyme called 2D6 in Zimbabwe. That was the first study on genetic variation in, in, in terms of drug response in Africa. And 30 years down the line, there are many young people now in my lab doing exciting work. And I'm just showing here the work done by um, uh, Mr. Comfort uh, Kanji, where he's now trying to show how this genetic variation in 2D6 could have implications on how people of African ancestry respond to breast cancer treatment with uh, tamoxifen. So really it's been a long journey and I hope that during this uh, uh, talk I can touch on some of the things that we, I believe will be important for the future. So uh, just to say a little bit about um, the company, the African Institute of Biomedical Science and Technology, uh, it is really a genomics and therapeutics uh, uh, company that focuses on, uh, on the discovery, development and deployment of pharmaceutical products. And so it's not a typical university setup, but one which is trying to look at the translational science bit, where we are saying whatever we come up with new ideas, new findings, how can we translate them to solutions in a clinical setting? So to do that, we have set up a robust genomics and uh, bioanalytics platform, which helps us to answer some of these questions. So our lab in terms of genomics, it is equipped all the way to next generation sequencing where we conduct whole genome, whole exon sequencing and single cell omics work. And this is really allowing us to tackle important questions in terms of heterogeneity of diseases and indeed the complexities of drug response where probably findings in Europe or in Asia are not applicable in the African populations. So we need to do a lot of work. And to support that wet lab, we have also established a very strong bioinformatic uh, platform to enable us to really understand the extent and structure of genetic variation, but also to use computer-aided drug design in terms of understanding the binding properties of ligands to receptors of interest. And in the area of bioanalytics, we to answer the questions which are important to us in terms of uh, drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics, PKPD, where we are really trying to understand how drug exposure levels uh, influence you know, response you know, in terms of efficacy or toxicity of medicines. So we have uh, bioanalytical platforms with uh, mass spectrometry as our workhorse where we can really analyze different type of uh, metabolites and, uh, and sort of relate that to uh, PBPK and PKPD modeling. So this is how our lab operates in, uh, in Zimbabwe. And of course, uh, we are always welcoming scientists from different parts of the world because we learn a lot from them and we can also share what we do. So our for today, I'm going to talk a lot about pharmacogenetics and the clinical scenario or challenge that is driving our research in this area is, is the variable response to medicines that one encounters. If you take patients who have a similar diagnosis, the doctor is most likely to go and prescribe the same drug at the same dose and expect the same outcome. 
But the reality on the ground is not like that. When this is done, this one treatment fits for fits all, there will be some patients who will not benefit at all from the drug. And unfortunately, some of them will have some toxicity. So those people are actually being poisoned by each visit they take to the doctor. And others, there's no benefit, there's no toxicity. So they are really paying for a placebo uh, encounter. And indeed, they, you want all to be the patients who benefit and with no toxicity, but those are very few. Most of the patients will have both the benefit and the toxicity. And we are asking the question, how can a doctor know which patient belongs to any of these subgroups? And once you now know that patient, what can the doctor do to enhance the treatment outcomes? So if you look, for example, therapeutic response, for many drugs, you know, the, the expected uh, efficacy is, is quite low because if you look at Alzheimer's disease, it can be as low as 30%. In some cancers, as low as 20% and so forth, where the biggest success, of course, is in uh, pain management. So really, efficacy rates are quite variable depending on the disease and the therapeutics uh, which are there, but also depending on the individual and the population, as I will show. And when it comes to adverse drug reactions, which are a huge you know, burden, you will notice that many people end up experiencing some adverse drug reactions. The publication in South Africa shows that one in nine people who are admitted, it is mostly because of an adverse drug reaction. Now, if you scale that to the cost to the healthcare system, it becomes quite enormous. So we believe that this is an important and unmet question which needs to be addressed. And our approach to addressing it has been, could genomic variation have anything to do with this differential response to medicines? So what we have done, you know, eventually is to try to collect blood samples from across Africa to just begin to have an insight on whether our genetic uh, uh, picture is the same as in Europe or in North America or in Asia. This is because most of the pharmaceuticals we use are all developed and discovered and developed on the backbone of European populations or Asian populations. And they are assumed to work the same when they come to us. So our first port of call was, what is the picture of genetic variation in Africa, in particular focusing on genes that are important for drug response, the pharmacogenes. So you see here, we have been collecting uh, through collaborations in Nigeria, samples from the Igbo, the Hausa, the Yoruba, in Kenya, the Masai, Kikuyu, and the Luo, in Tanzania, some mixed populations, in Zimbabwe, the Shona, the Sun, and the Ndebele, in South Africa, the Venda, and so forth. So we now have a biobank with samples from all these uh, populations in Africa. And when we, when we looked at the variation in this population, it was a stunning finding way back in 2014, where we could show that if we compare with the uh, database uh, uh, variation and, you know, on Caucasians and Orientals, you will find that the people of European ancestry tend to cluster together, indicating their genetic similarity. And on the other hand, the Oriental population, the Asians, they also tend to cluster, also indicating their similarity. But when we looked at the 2000 samples we had collected across Africa, it was incredible to notice that whilst they are distinct from the Caucasian and Asian populations, among us themselves, they're extremely diverse. Which means that, you know, indeed, if you collapse this principal component uh, to PC1, you will notice that uh, the Orientals and the Asians, they are closer to each other and further separated from the African populations. And this is, of course, uh, uh, in sync with our hypothesis of the out of Africa uh, migration. And uh, so I, I was just checking the, 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 the chat box there. Because, so just to further describe this, so it means that the African populations, they are distinct from these two populations where most of the pharmaceutical drug discovery and development is happening. And the drugs are now shifted to these populations. We want to know, is this going to be appropriate? But secondly, Africa is always taken as one unit one country because of political historical factors but when we look at the genetic architecture it is very clear that people of african ancestry are quite diverse so it might mean also that um, uh, you cannot just group them together and say this drug will work in africans 
it will be a question of African, which African population. So this really was a very important thing, which has now been confirmed with whole genome sequence data, which have been published recently, where I think Ananyo and colleagues have shown that after whole genome sequence of over 400 uh, people of African ancestry, they discovered over 3 million novel as yet undescribed genetic variants. So there is a lot that is un yet unknown in terms of function and its presence, we are just beginning to see it. So this was the, really the entry point for some of our, uh, our interest uh, in, uh, in uh, population response. Why that is important is that we have now studying single genes, have seen that for some drugs, there will be people who are very good at eliminating the drug once they have taken it. So some of them will call them ultra rapid metabolizers, those ones in green. So if you give them the standard dose, they might metabolize it so fast that they will end up with sub-therapeutic concentrations, the blue line here. But most people, of course, will have the normal concentrations expected for therapeutic benefit because that is how the, the studies are done in the clinical trials to find those who are going to respond properly. So those we call the normal or extensive metabolizers, and they will be within this black line, within the safe and effective dose. But there are also a subgroup of people who have non-functional uh, genes so that they don't produce the enzymes that are important. So each time you dose them, the concentrations of the drug keeps increasing until it reaches toxic levels. And that's the red line here. So this is the, sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened here. So this is the relationship we are exploring to sort of say for a particular gene, and this particular gene here is called 2D6 and it is responsible for the metabolism of over 20% of drugs on the market. So if you sub, uh, if you put people in these subgroups, you can now already imagine how many people are likely to respond differently to those 20% of drugs on the market. And then here we can show that from the genetic status, the people who don't have a functional enzyme, they usually have deleterious mutations in the gene. And those who are ultra rapid metabolizers either have duplications, or amplifications of the gene, they end up producing more of the enzyme. So this is the kind of relationship, the genotype and phenotype relationship we are sort of working on in most of our research. And we are trying to say this genotype phenotype relationship, what are the clinical implications of that relationship? And I hope that I will show some examples which can convince you that there is a story to tell, there is a science to take to the clinic that can make things better for our patients. So why the drug metabolizing enzymes have become important uh, area of research for me for the past 30 years or so is that for the drugs on the market, for the body to remove them so that, you know, if the drugs remain in the body, you can imagine the kind of undesirable effects. So once the drug has done its work of treating uh, the disease, it must get out. So the drug metabolizing enzymes are the system that has evolved to do that. So 75% of the drugs, they depend on drug metabolizing enzymes for their exit from the body. And of course, the, the other ones just, they don't have to be metabolized. The renal system will remove them, about 20 20 20% of those. Then others require, you know, the bio using the, the, uh, the bio secretion route. But as you can see, metabolism is extremely important. Hence the effort we have spent over the past many years. And within the drug metabolizing enzymes, it turns out that the major enzymes are the cytochrome P450s, followed by the UGTs and esterases. Hence, my work has been mostly on cytochrome P450s because they are responsible for over 75% of the metabolism uh, of medicines. And so the work we do. And of those uh, drug metabolizing enzymes, most of them all show genetic variation such that other people have highly active um, um, enzymes, others intermediate, and others uh, almost no function. So it means that almost any other drug you encounter, there will be a variation between individuals and population that is a genetic basis. And that is the one which we spend most of our time trying to understand. And the outcome, as I've just indicated before, it can be really due to gene deletion, 
It can be gene amplification where you end up with uh, many copies of RNA copies and you produce more enzyme and you have increased activity. But it can be gene deletion or you know, loss of function, genetic variants, you end up with no enzyme being produced. And in between is a whole range of genetic variation, which either changes the amount of enzyme produced or it changes the binding pocket of the enzyme such that the affinity for the substrates is changed ultimately re resulting in reduced uh, catalytic activity, hence reduced drug clearance. So you can have that whole range, hence that normal distribution um, uh, you observe. If you give a particular drug to a population, the clearance rate will differ across uh, due to these uh, molecular mechanisms. And just to give you an example of one particular genetic variant we discovered many years ago, but is starting to show major clinical implications is called the C2D6 type 17. And this we found in the Zimbabwean population, and it was the one which enables us to understand why people of African ancestry were tended to be slow metabolizers of this class of compounds. And when we did the modeling around it, we were then able to also show that whilst this mutation occurs very far from the active site, it causes a cascade of changes which end up changing the binding pocket. And we could now start to understand which amino acids are, are more influenced by that change which happens at a long distance from the binding pocket. And when we looked at the effect on drugs on the market, like the beta blocker metoprolol and other drugs, dexamethorphan and thioridazine, the effect of that variant for each of the drugs is also different. This is another complexity. It's not only low activity, but the low activity varies depending on the substrate because the Catalytic activity is determined by the binding um, uh, parameters in the active site. So it means metoprolol and dexamethorphan and thyroidazine bind differently in the active pocket and are affected differently uh, in terms of uh, metabolic clearance. As you can see here, metoprolol clearance is reduced 40%, uh, 40 but dexamethorphan is highly influenced with over 80% reduction in, in, in clearance. Thyroidazine is uh, somewhere in between there at 30%. So this is the kind of mechanistic or molecular work you will be doing in the lab. But of course, the question comes, what are the implications in a clinical setting? So what we then did was, well, let's look at a whole family of pharmacogenes and see if they demonstrate the same diversity we had observed in a genome-wide uh, 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 sort of uh, structure analysis, which I showed you before, was that when we were just using one of the Illumina chips. But here we wanted to put genes which are important for drug response. And when we did that, again, we observed the population clustering. The genetic variants for the drug metabolizing enzymes, some are unique for the Chinese populations, some are unique for the European populations, and many are unique for the African populations. So we were even now more convinced that the genomic diversity we observe also goes way down to variation for specific pharmacogenes. And we were more convinced that then we can look for a clinical framework to understand this better. And we are thinking that we are moving into a future where this one treatment fits all, where everyone is given the same drug, but indeed in others, there's no effect in others, there's an effect, but it is accompanied by adverse, intolerable adverse drug reactions. And we want to move to the panel below where we are saying, once we have a diagnosis, we want to understand which will be the best drug the patient will respond to and what will be the best dose to give so that we end up with efficacy and minimal adverse drug reactions. And this is the emerging uh, area of precision medicine where we would end up with almost everyone being this favorable graph. Of course, that's the that's the bold ambition, but of course, I'm sure uh, it will be somewhere in between. So, but then things are actually starting to happen. Uh, this research in the lab has been occurring. I mean, it's happening since the early '90s. But uh, in, in the past five, ten years now, FDA and EMA have now be begun to recognize the clinical evidence accumulating indicating that this can really be used to optimize treatment. So now over 500 medicines have had their product label revised.
to include some information on the role of genetic variation. So most of the information does not tell you what to do, but it tells the doctor or the patient to be aware that they might respond differently to a particular drug. So in terms of actionable information, it is now only available for about 100 medicines where people have looked at the clinical evidence and they found it indicative that if you apply this knowledge, you can have a better outcome for your patient. So really, there is still a lot of clinical work that needs to be done to validate or to confirm or to quantify the role of genetics such that it can be applied in the clinical setting. But as I've indicated before, all this is being done in people of European ancestry for obvious reasons that the pharmaceutical industry is resident there. The clinical trials are being done in those populations. But the unfortunate thing is the generalization to the world population might not be uh, well informed, hence our efforts in this area. So this is the typical information FDA will have, ABACAV for HIV, the HLA uh, genetic variant. If one has that variant, you are not supposed to take ABACAV. So, you know, the, so you have a black box warning and it goes on and on for the over 500 drugs. So you can always look at that link and you can see uh, what has happened to the different drugs. In terms of those with their actionable guidelines, you will find that there are two major bodies, the CPEC for the American and the, the Dutch uh, Pharmacogenesis Working Group for the European. But they don't always agree because of the clinical evidence and other uh, factors they take into account. Again, you can go to these websites and you can see which drugs there is now actionable drug gene interaction information, which tells you the choice of drug and the dose adjustments that need to be made if a patient is carrying a particular genetic variant. So we then reviewed activities that had been done in Africa. So this review we did uh, 2020. And in confirmation of other reports, there is very little clinical studies happening in Africa. When you look at the total clinical studies in pharmacogenetics, only less than 1% are being done on the in, in people of African ancestry. And most of them are actually done in African American, which means even less in Africa. So there's need for a transition to more clinical studies which take drug gene interaction into account. And these are the different studies that have been done. There are actually only hundreds. The pie chart makes it look like you have a lot of things going on. There are only a uh, hundred clinical studies that we could see that took genetics into consideration. But when we now we now said, how relevant is this going to be? So we started, of course, with Zimbabwe. We looked at over 600 uh, healthy volunteers. We genotyped them for uh, over 40 you know, genes, which have genetic variation, which is important for dr drug response. And when you look at how many people are carrying one, two, or three, or four, five, six actionable drug, drug, uh, drug gene interactions, as you can see, many people are carrying at least three actionable ones. So it means that there's, they, there are very few people who are taking a medicine which does not require a, a, a genetic intervention to make a better outcome. And when we looked at which genes are most important for the Zimbabwean populations, we could see that if we look at the drugs that are being procured in Zimbabwe and for these different diseases, we can see that the CYP2D6 and G6PD um, are the most affected or most important uh, genes and, 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 and the relevant enzymes that are produced that would be important in our populations. So already we can already see what genes we should focus on for the different uh, drug classes we have, but also the fact that most of our population is carrying at least three uh, uh, drug gene interactions of clinical relevance. So we really th think we are making a case uh, for the introduction of precision medicine. But to further prove it, I'll give you two cases we have been working on in the past years. One is of efavirenz, and the other one is of tamoxifen. So efavirenz is the, the antiretroviral drug, non-nucleoside analog inhibitor, and it has been really effective in, uh, in fighting the, uh, the HIV. But its problems in terms of clinical use is hepatotoxicity and neuropsychiatric adverse drug reactions. And we wanted to understand that better. And when you looked at tamoxifen, which is a drug used to treat breast cancer, uh, we, this drug you know, 
it is associated with very poor efficacy where more than 50 percent of the patients might not have the best uh, treatment outcome so we wanted to see the potential role of genetic variation in the african population in these drugs so the next uh, slides are really trying to just show you how far we have gone with this here i've just indicated that this genetic variant a G2AT uh, in the in the 2B6 enzyme is associated with highly reduced enzyme activity, which then means that in a standard dose of 600 milligrams, you will have very high exposure levels, which are associated with the neuropsychiatric side effects. So what we then looked at uh, the an HIV court we are studying at one of the hospitals here in uh, Zimbabwe, and we could show that uh, in these HIV patients taking a favorance, you know more than 30% of them were experiencing these severe neuropsychiatric side effects. And when we went to the WHO uh, 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 database for the reporting of adverse drug reactions, efavirenz, before nevirapine had been removed, efavirenz was number two. But at the time we were doing the work, efavirenz was now number one. It was also indicated as one of the drugs with the uh, highest number of adverse drug reactions reported um, by clinicians. So we really had something we believed we could solve uh, using genetic um, um, approaches. And we did a number of studies to really understand the association of the genetic variation and drug exposure. And, um, and the star 6 and star 18 became very important in terms of the association we were looking at. So what we ended up with was a clear demonstration that the variant which is associated with reduced activity is found at higher frequency in people of african ancestry and it is found at lower frequency in people in asian ancestry and in people of european ancestry no wonder when the drug was first introduced in europeans fewer people five to ten percent ended ex up experiencing these neuropsychiatric side effects but when it was introduced in africa more than 30% of the people were reporting these severe adverse drug reactions. So it goes back to my, 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 my concern that the transfer of safety data from clinical studies done in Europe might not always transfer to another population. And this was a typical case. What we then went on to do using pharmacometric approaches was to develop an algorithm which is guided by the patient's genetic makeup gender and weight as we had seen those as key variables in exposure levels and we came up with an algorithm which showed that people who were homozygous for the variant needed only 200 milligrams instead of 600 milligrams and those who were homozygous weight became important if they were more than less than 62 kgs they needed a lower dose in particular in females they would need 400 milligrams and this is the algorithm we presented to the scientific community. And at the same time, many other studies reproduced our work in Tanzania, in Ethiopia, and in Uganda. And then a non-inferiority study was then done to show that 400 was uh, non-inferior to 600. And that really pushed then WHO to start thinking of changing the dose from 600 to 400, hence the change in guidelines that subsequently occurred. So really our work also contributed to the clinical guidelines, which we co-authored with other international scientists working in this space. And so, as you can imagine, pharmaceutical industry, we are now very keen to produce 400 milligrams, but lo and behold, uh, another better drug came along, dolutegravir, and WHO quickly changed the guidelines from efavirenz to dolutegravir. So in terms of a market for us as a diagnostic test, which we were thinking to deploy, and for Cibra, which was producing the 400 milligrams, it was too late for the market because the market had shifted due to the change in drug which WHO introduced. So now most people are all being moved from efavirenz to dolutegravir. Of course, dolutegravir has its own issues which us and other people are looking at. But this just tells you a story. So I'll give you another story on tamoxifen, which is really uh, quite. Uh, Current in our lab. Tamoxifen itself is not the e effective molecule. It is a pro drug. It is metabolized in the liver by the enzyme CYP2D6 to endoxifen. Endoxifen is the one which has a almost uh, 100 times more potency than tamoxifen. So, really, 
your therapeutic response uh, uh, is determined by how uh, how active is your 2D6 to activate the tamoxifen. So we have looked, you know, the genetic variant we discovered many years ago, star 17, and other people also discovered star 29, which are low activity variants. We looked at different populations to just see whether already there's a clue that African populations might respond differently to tamoxifen compared to Asians and to, uh, to Europeans. When you look at the star 17, star 29, you will see that it is almost exclusively found in people of African ancestry. And rarely is it found in Europeans or Asians. So already we were thinking the role of these genetic variants could be important for tamoxifen efficacy. So what we did is we did a study in South Africa, Barabaneth Hospital, where we had uh, more than you know, 500 breast cancer patients. And we started to look at the concentrations of endoxifen and the concentrations of tamoxifen and the, the other intermediate metabolites. And here we could see that there's a subgroup, which, is, uh, which are poor metabolizers or with very little endoxifen. And we just came up with this antimodel of 1.75. The people on the far right being very compromised in their capacity to generate endoxifen. So we, we did further work on that to try to understand. So here, tamoxifen is metabolized to end desmethyl tamoxifen, which is further metabolized to endoxifen. And the key enzyme is CYP2D6. We wanted to estimate the, the extent of reduced capacity to metabolize. And so we, we did this work, uh, which was done by Com uh, Comfort Kanji, and we could show that uh, with this calibration at the, on, on, the, on the right, that the star 17 only had 30% activity of the normal one. And this is a huge reduction, which we believe was able to explain why such patients who carry these variants have very reduced capacity to produce endoxifen. So we are beginning to ask ourselves, what does this mean? Uh, for for the doses being given. Currently, tamoxifen is given at 20 milligrams per day. And when you do that, you will see that people who are homozygous for star 17, most of them end up in the sub-therapeutic range for endoxifen. So we have done some uh, PK simulations to say how much should be given to these people who are star 17, star 17, so that they can reach the therapeutic levels of endoxifen. And this model ensures that we should go to up to 40 milligrams a day. So this is where we are, and we are asking the question, maybe we should do a study to see whether we should move to 40 milligrams a day. Fortunately, the 40 milligrams per day is already an approved dose. So there will be less regulatory issues around changing from 20 to 40. But we, start, we just need to know whether the, the number and severity of adverse drug reactions does not uh, increase to an unacceptable range even though it is an approved dose. But I think you can see where we are going with the story that in this particular case, we are asking for an increase in the dose so that the enzyme has enough substrate to convert to endoxifen. So, so really what this whole thing made us appreciate is that each time you sequence any group of patients from Africa taking a particular drug, you always bump into a genetic variant. Then the next stage is to validate that variant for clinical you know, uh, relevance. And what we have now done is we have collected a number of genetic variants we have, we have discovered and validated. And we have taken the genetic variants which have been validated in uh, European populations and Asian populations. And we have come up with an, uh, an open array which has all these genetic variants, about 120 of them, in 40 genes, pharmacogenes, so that we can test an individual, even though we'll be trying to address the specific drug they are on, we will also collect information for the future drugs they are going to be put on, so that in the future, they only have to present their genetic summary, and the doctor would know which drugs to avoid or which dose adjustments to make. So that is what we call genofarm. That is our innovation. Here I'm just showing you that it can take really long, but it need, it need not take this long for the many young people in this in this um, uh, meeting. But for us, it was the research phase. You know, in the, from the 1993 when I started working in this area all the way to 2007, we have been doing a lot of research, 
And you need to understand the funders for research are different for the funders who are for product development. So we're getting our money from International Science Program, EDC, TP, and so forth to conduct research. When we were now doing clinical validation, we are now getting funding from different funders. Uh, EDC, TP continued to fund us. But to do the pilot product, uh, the NEPAD uh, or Alder Sun Bioorgan started to fund us. And we also got funding from Stanford, the SPAC program. And even further, as we were going through the Houting Accelerator program, uh, we're helping us to fund this to see how clinically valid it is. And indeed, by uh, 20, uh, uh, 2017, we had our product registered with SAPRA. So it really takes a long time. And uh, we, we hope this time can be shortened. And indeed, I think it can be, especially with the new sequencing technology platforms and faster routes, uh, regulatory pathways to, to registration. That should work. But we are also happy to recall that we have been recognized for this work by different uh, organizations, which is something we appreciate because you can imagine their competing interests for things that can impact society. But for them to recognize that the work we are doing in genetic variation for drug response is important, it means there's a certain buy-in which is going on. And we really appreciate uh, that recognition. And of course, acknowledge all the collaborators who were involved in us getting that far. So this is the uh, chip we have developed in our Genofarm. And we collaborated with uh, Temo Fisher, who have uh, fabricated this um, uh, open RA chip. And this is our license uh, with SAPRA. And now I just need to indicate that also here in Zimbabwe, it is now registered with the Medicines uh, Control Authority of Zimbabwe so that we can use it in the clinical setting. And this has actually led us now to propose a major study in Africa, which we are calling Implementing Pharmacogenomic Testing for effective care and treatment in Africa, uh, acronym I protect And we are really thinking of uh, targeting over 10,000 patients uh, across Africa. And for this work, we have now been awarded a, a grant by the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. And uh, this is really taking us uh, off the ground in this uh, uh, project. What really motivates this project is that if you look at this map, you know, Africa is basically absent. Uh, in North America, there are many multi, you know, center studies that are trying to show how to implement P pharmacogenetics in a clinical setting. In Europe, there are major studies, multinational studies that are being done. In Asia, you know, in particular Japan and, uh, and, and related countries, there are major projects going on. And in Africa, there's been the... Uh, this silence on the topic, and yet our genomic diversity data, which is now being confirmed by results from the H3 Africa initiative, that there is enormous variation, which is important maybe for biomarkers for disease risk and biomarkers for drug response. So we wanted to start a multinational project, as this uh, project which we are calling Eye Protector, which is going to involve South Africa, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and Nigeria and uh, looking at 10,000 patients on different treatments. And we believe that we can then make Af Africa be part of the genomic medicine uh, sort of transition from one treatment with fits all to pre precision personalized medicine. So that's what we are hoping to do with uh, this project. And to do that, we have now come up with a, a consortium which we are calling the Consortium for Genomics and Therapeutics in Africa, involving those four countries and uh, the specific universities of Zimbabwe, University of Cape Town, and uh, Strathmore University in Kenya, uh, the Obafemi Awalwale University in Nigeria. And uh, Professor Kolech Dandara, of course, is uh, one of our top scientists in pharmacogenesis in Africa. He will be the one responsible for the South African in the activities. Uh, uh, Dr. Ndorvu in Zimbabwe, an oncologist, and uh, Professor Ogutu in Kenya, and Professor Bolaji in Nigeria. So this consortium really is trying to push this. And of course, we needed a lot of experience from people who are running similar consortia in uh, North America and, in, and, and in, uh, in Europe and in Asia. So we have identified these people who have really agreed to become of part of our scientific and technical advisory committee so that we don't have to make 
some of the errors and we can learn quickly on some areas where advancements has been made to be able to implement such a massive project. So this is how we are generally hoping to do it, that we want to look at uh, some patients who will be uh, treated based on the uh, genetic test, the, um, the genome, and other patients will be the current standard of care. Then we compare the outcomes in many different ways in terms of adverse drug reactions, in terms of efficacy, in terms of cost effectiveness of cost benefit analysis, so that we are going to be looking at many variable parameters, knowledge and attitude of clinicians, pharmacists and nurses. So it's a multifaceted study uh, under this uh, program. So, and what we've also done is to partner with the uh, genomics information management system um, uh, company, uh, Biologis in, in German, which has developed a very nice um, uh, software which helps to the communication between the lab, the clinicians, and the patient, so that the results can really uh, be shared in, in, in time that is important to effect change. Because if the turnaround times are too slow, then the genetic results will come you know, when they are not needed anymore. So we are really looking at a situation where we have three to five days turnaround time for the results to, uh, for when a sample is collected, um, and the sample is sent to the lab, the results are generated, they are uploaded on um, this genomic information management system, the doctor sees them and acts. So we want to have this in a three to five day cycle, and we think it's possible uh, as we are starting to pilot uh, this project. So what we therefore decided in terms of the eye protector is to first pilot it so that we can address some of the implementation barriers or take advantage of certain opportunities and, and so forth. So we have done now about uh, nine studies and here I'm just showing uh, uh, some of them which have now just been published and others are, in, uh, are, are under review. We were looking at the toxicity uh, uh, due to toxirubicin, uh, cardiotoxicity due to toxirubicin and looking at the genetic variants which have been said to be predictive. And we wanted to see how many people are carrying these genetic variants in our patient population, and how many people are on this drug, and how many people are experiencing the side effects that have been reported in Europe and Asia, and are the non-genetic variants in any way associated with the risk for those adverse drug reactions? Those are the basic questions we are asking in the pilot so that we can choose drug, disease, and gene combination that we believe can be impactful when we roll it out in uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Kenya, and Nigeria. And here we can see the studies we have done for, uh, for also uh, looking at pain management in sickle cell disease, because people who are given these pain medicines like codeine, uh, tramadol, if you do not have functional 2D6, those drugs will not be useful in you because you cannot generate the active metabolites, because those are pro-drugs. So for such patients, they would need a different pain uh, painkiller, so to speak. So we are trying to look at how do we manage pain in, in the sickle cell patients. And, and this, as you can imagine, in West Africa, this is a huge uh, challenge which needs to be, to be addressed, because the longer it takes for you to manage the pain, the longer these uh, young uh, people suffer the pain, and of course their participation in society is also reduced. And the cost to the healthcare system is enormous. We have also looked at uh, uh, the use of uh, drugs like 5-fluorouracil, uh, which is the biggest problem is toxicity. And we wanted to understand whether the currently non-genetic variants in the DPYB gene are important, or are they there at all? And this all preliminary data is beginning to show us that just as we uh, had suspected, the, some of the genetic variants which have been associated with toxicity of 5 fluorouracil are not even uh, present in this pilot study, which means that when we are now doing the next study, it is more discovery study rather than implementing what is known. And when we look at the sickle cell disease, we are now clear that because of the star 17 and star 29 high prevalence, we think that it's a ready for implementation. So the studies we are going to be doing are more implementation around that. 
And in the breast cancer, it will also be probably more implementation. So these pilot studies are really shedding light, uh, which is, uh, I believe, uh, quite uh, informative on uh, design and execution of the major eye protector. So the take home message, like I've indicated, that we are now going to do uh, the sickle cell uh, disease uh, pain management uh, uh, study, and we'll also do the gastrointestinal tumor treatment uh, approach for erinotican and 5-fluorouracil. But for TB, we are finding very interesting because the TB treatments is one of the most complex treatments, you know, I guess in the same family as HIV where you have many drugs being given and for a long time. So the risk for liver injury is high. So drug-induced liver injury is something we are very interested in our lab. So we are doing this study to try to identify biomarkers for uh, drug-induced liver toxicity. And so there is a, a study going on. And here, I think I just have a few slides which show uh, this particular study is uh, Dr. Majindu uh, is uh, the PhD on the study on uh, eye protector oncology, looking at the use of 5-fluorouracil and erinotecan uh, in the different uh, gas GIT tumors, esophageal, stomach, and colon and anal cancers. And this is just a pictorial depiction of this. The study design is, I think he will start his studies, uh, he will start patient recruitment sometime in September. And uh, Dr. Joseph Olarawagu, uh, um, a, 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 a doctor in, in Nigeria, he's the one who is going to be leading the eye protector sickle cell disease. And we are going to just start by looking at about a thousand sickle cell disease patients. We created a database. And as those patients come for their pain management during the year, we now apply the genetic testing first to choose the drug and optimize the doses, say, for morphine. So then through that process over a year, we'll be able to really tease out how this genetic testing can be put as an intervention or as a, as a, a modifying you know, diagnostic test in the, in the management of pain in sickle cell patients. And uh, uh, lastly here, uh, we have Vincent, uh, who, is, who is PhD is now on the drug-induced uh, liver injury. This is a study we are doing at Paraguani um, with um, Professor Neil Martinson at, um, um, with a, who has a cohort in South Africa, where we are now looking at uh, the old cohort he has worked on and the new uh, cohort he has started. And we are now identifying those people with the, uh, extreme drug-induced liver injury then we are doing targeted gene sequencing to see if we can pick strong biomarkers. We are also measuring the concentrations of the anti-TB drugs so that we can do a PKPD model to better understand who is at risk so that we can better identify those at risk and maybe propose a different approach to that uh, to their treatment um, for, for, for uh, to just remove, to reduce the death that can be associated with the uh, drug-induced liver injury because amongst people with daily they are this very high mortality and we need to be able to avoid that so i just want to end my presentation uh wishing you a happy africa day tomorrow but uh, as uh, as you enjoy yourself you are appreciating the, the diversity of africa culturally you must also that know that it translates to genomic diversity and we are now thinking a lot on how can we come up with an African genomic diversity target product profile framework, which can guide you know, drug discovery, development and deployment, where if through Africa CDC, we can come up with a guideline or a regulation that says, uh, encourages pharmaceutical companies to always include African populations in clinical trials, so that the safety and efficacy is also confirmed in the background of the genetic diversity we, we have. And to also show that the genetic diversity of Africa is an asset for global health research. So it's not a burden, but it is a tool that can be, help us better understand disease risk factors and drug response factors and better inform the drug discovery uh, process. So we must see it as some an asset we can bring on the table for biomedical research with our collaborators globally. So with that, I want to also thank 
the people who do all this work and I'm here as their spokesman. So I'm grateful to all this range of collaborators, uh, colleagues, uh, and, uh, and as you can imagine is across Africa. So our project really, um, genomics and, and therapeutics for Africa is well represented by how we engage uh, across uh, the, the, the the countries in Africa. And also in particular, I want to take note of the recognizing the students, those youngsters in lab course. We have done most of the pilot studies I, I've just reported. They've done it tremendously well. And I really wish them well and a, and a great career in genomic research. With that, I want to thank you all for listening to me. And I'm, uh, I can take any questions that you might have so that I can clarify some of the issues I've, uh, some of the data I've presented. Thank you.